And this is an easy introduction. I mean, to have the possibility of bringing a legend to this podium and to say a few words, not about her career as a justice of the Supreme Court, but about the wonderful life that she has led in the years that brought her to the Supreme Court. Her grandfather and father were pioneers of the West, settling in New Mexico territory, which later became Arizona. And the Lazy Bee Ranch, if you read her memoir, is very much a part of her life and of her character. She was born in a depression year, and her parents and her family knew very well what the depression was, the unemployment, the poverty, the difficulties of just staying above the line. Yet, her father was not a great advocate of FDR. I remember once reading about Barbara Bush, who said that in her household, the name Eleanor Roosevelt was not allowed to be repeated. <laughs> but in the Day household, there was perhaps not an admiration of FDR, but there was that extraordinary personal character and perseverance and dedication that they gave to the daughter. And that character, I think, is one of the things that has been acknowledged in what she's done. She went to Stanford University. She graduated in the top 10% of her class. She was on the Law Review. And she never could get a job. She was one of five women in that law school class. And with that extraordinary record, she was not offered a job by the major law firms. But she found other good things at Stanford, including a wonderful husband who was also a lawyer and the friendship with Bill Rehnquist, who was in her class, also from Arizona. And that friendship was a lifelong friendship, and it's extraordinary the two of them served those years together on the court. When she graduated and she came back to Phoenix, she and her husband decided to do that, she didn't take the easy way out. She set up her own law firm. If you can imagine that responsibility, and all of us here who are lawyers, I think, look at that very simple act as a great act of courage. Then she became the, uh, an assistant attorney general. She mothered three young, three sons, and she was active in Republican politics. You know, Arizona in the 50s and 60s was an extraordinary place in politics. That's where the conservative movement really began. You had Barry Goldwater in 1952 unseating the Democratic majority leader, Ernest McFarland, as I recall it. And Sandra Day O'Connor was part of the young Republican movement that brought about and supported Barry Goldwater, who was a very great friend and admirer of hers, and supported him in the 1964 presidential election. She was the beneficiary of a great Supreme Court ruling, one man, one vote, because that ruling caused Phoenix to gain 15 seats in the state Senate that they might not otherwise have had. And because of her Republican background and having worked in the party, she asked for a nomination to that, and she received that in 1969 and went to the state Senate, and where she became a real power within the five-year career that she had there. She then ran a primary. That's it's just quite extraordinary if you've been through the political understanding to understand what it is to run a primary within your own party for a seat on the Superior Court in Arizona, and she won that a tough primary. Now, in 19, President Nixon, as you know, had four appointments to the Supreme, Supreme Court. Sandra Day O'Connor wrote him a letter in 1970 saying that as he approached his presidency that he should really contemplate appointing a woman to the Supreme Court. There was an interesting tape that uh, has been now revealed because of the presidential libraries that has the Nixon tapes where he is discussing whether or not he should put a woman on the Supreme Court. And he says to his aide, I'm against it, frankly. I don't want any of them around. <laughs> Thank God, he said, we don't have any of them in the cabinet. <laughs> but then he said, but the cabinet's so lousy, we might as well have a woman in it. <laughs> but out of those appointments, came the appointment of Judge Rehnquist. And that, of course, uh, Sandra Day O'Connor uh, supported with great enthusiasm. She was appointed to the highest court in Arizona by a Democrat, Bruce Babbitt, 
who was then governor. Many of you in this room know. And he appointed her, as he said, because she was the most qualified person that he could find, and he wanted a woman on that bench. So with that all in place, uh, Potter Stewart once said about how do you get on the Supreme Court? He says, it's like lightning. You have to be in the right place at the right time. And so in 1981, when Potter Stewart talked to the Attorney General and said that he wanted to resign, and then they began the search for a candidate, everybody recalled, and especially the President, President Reagan recalled his own commitment to the public in the 1980 campaign that he was going to appoint a woman. You know what the, all of that meant? When Jimmy Carter came to office in 1977, only eight women in the history of the United States had sat on the federal bench. When Jimmy Carter left office in 1981, there were 43 women on the bench. And so when President Reagan heard about Sandra Day O'Connor, and she went through a very tough vetting process. I mean, it didn't begin just recently. And finally, she had the opportunity of meeting the president himself. Well, can you imagine two people who would like each other more than those two? Here was the open West, the whole feeling about it. Talking, I can hear it, talking about the ranch, talking about horseback riding, talking about fixing fences. Oh, by the way, the Supreme Court, I want to talk to you about that. <laughs> and so she got it. And so she was confirmed. The vote was 99 to nothing. Senator Baucus was out of town at that time. <laughs> it was certainly a great historical event. But it was a fulfillment of a major step forward for America. And Senator Day O'Connor has done everything that all of us, not Republicans, not Democrats, but all of us would have hoped that she would do. The focus was on her as the first woman. She said her concern was that she wouldn't be the last woman. And so she knew that the responsibility she had to carry was an enormous responsibility. And I can't imagine anyone having discharged it with greater success than she. I like to think of the scene on September 25th, 1981, when the Attorney General of the United States brought Sandra Day O'Connor into the marshal chair and presented her to the court. In the courtroom was President and Mrs. Reagan. In the courtroom were her father and mother, and of course her husband and children, and her siblings. What a moment in history, what a moment of personal fulfillment, what a triumphant moment for democracy. And Justice O'Connor, that's the way we all feel today. So honored to have you here. Thank you.